So when we start looking at gravity, we're going to start, Alexis, with something you already know, but I'm going to try and phrase it differently or have you think about it differently. The first thing I said here is objects in free fall near the Earth accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared. We, we were convinced of that. We did a little lab where we tried to measure it last year. Okay, why? The reason that they accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared is because the Earth has a gravitational field strength of 9.8 newtons per kilogram. The Earth pulls on every kilogram of mass with 9.8 newtons of force. F equals what, what? Get the A by itself, please. A equals. When we're talking about forces, a equals F over M, which is newtons per kilogram. We've typically talked about acceleration as meters per second squared, which it is. But when you're talking about it in terms of forces, it's a newton per kilogram. The reason things move at, accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared is because the, the Earth pulls on them with 9.8 newtons of force for every kilogram. So that is an acceleration, which is why they'll accelerate at 9.8. And whether you call it meters per second squared or whether you call it newtons per kilogram, it's the gravitational field strength of the Earth. Up until now, We've had two ways, or been aware of two ways, to determine that 9.8. We did one way last year. We dropped objects from uh, the ceiling, I think, with you folks, and we dropped erasers. We timed them, and we tried to calculate G, and we hoped we were close to 9.8. But you can imagine, if I had electric instruments, I could get that 9.8 bang on. So one way is to start out with... Uh, dropping an object in a magnetic field, uh, sorry, in a gravitational field in a vacuum and timing its free fall. Uh, the other way, by the way, is to actually measure the gravity field at a point by measuring the weight of a small test mass. Let me show you what I mean. Pause the video for a second, Mr. Duick. So Alexis, what I really want you to realize is this. Another way to say acceleration due to gravity is gravitational field strength, which is probably a better description. Oh, measured in newtons per kilogram, which also is the same, it turns out, as meters per second squared. So you okay with that little changing that 9.8 to mean something a bit different, but still the same? So then this leads us to a question. How can we figure out little g on planets that we haven't been to yet? We had to know how big the moon's gravitational field strength was before we landed on it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have known how, build, how big to build the rockets. Okay. Newton, in his experiments, found that the universal gravitational field strength, the ability to find gravity field anywhere in the universe, depended on two things. It depended on the mass of the object that was creating the gravity field, the mass of the planet, the mass of the moon, the mass of the star, the mass of whatever object is sending out the gravitational field. And it depended on the square of the distance from the center of the object. Psst! Look up! Look up. Everybody look up for one sec. Everyone, Hannah, you two look up. Hannah, look up. It depended on R squared. The distance from the center, R squared. Okay. Now, he found that when this second one got bigger, the answer got smaller. So he said, okay, the R squared is on the bottom. He found when the mass got larger, the gravitational field got bigger, so the M was on the top. He said that universal gravity field, that's not 9.8, that's G anywhere in the universe, there's a symbol for is proportional to or depends on, it's a little fish like that. Newton said, look, 
I know that gravity depends on those, the gravitational field strength depends on those two things. Um, what's mass measured in? What's R measured in? This is kilogram meter per meter squared. This will not be newtons per kilogram. So he said, okay, we need to multiply by a conversion factor. In the same way, how do you go from meters per second to kilometers per hour? You times by, okay, there's a conversion factor and it takes care of the units for you. There's a conversion factor for this. Here's our universal gravitational field. The conversion factor, since it affects gravity, we are gonna use a capital G for its symbol. Big G, M over R squared. Where R is how far you are from the center of the planet. By the way, this will allow us to figure out how the 9.8 changes as we get further and further from Earth as well. Big M is the mass of the planet, and G, unfortunately, is an inconvenient number. It's called the universal gravitational constant. I've typed it out, but just so you can see, it's 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. And its units are newtons meters squared per kilogram squared. That's what's required to give us an answer for the gravitational field in newtons per kilogram. 6.67 times 10 to the what? Is that on your formula sheet? Now you want to this unit, look at the data section of your formula sheet where I have a whole bunch of data and it is there. You'll probably end up memorizing this one because you're gonna get sick of looking it up, but you don't need to. Can you all find where the big G is? Yes? Okay. That's the gravitational constant of the universe. That's not a force. It's not an acceleration, it's a conversion factor. By the way, 6.67 times 10 to negative 11, big number or small number? Small. Newton couldn't figure it out. He said, I know it's gotta be there, but what he did is he set up all of his equations so that the big G's canceled. It took actually quite some time. A scientist named Cavendish came and figured it out. So. I mean, that's point zero 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 six six seven. It's tiny. What that means, by the way, Ronan, is gravity is, you're with me, not working on other stuff, is by far the weakest force in the universe because you have to multiply it by a really small number so that it's accurate. It's a tiny, tiny force. You might think it's the largest force in the universe. It's trillions of times smaller than the other forces in the universe. So I wrote here, notice how small G is. This is because the force of gravity is by far the smallest of the four fundamental forces. Yep, sorry? Uh, electromagnetism, which explains electricity and magnetism. Okay, that's the one that probably impacts you the most without you realizing it. Then the two other ones occur inside the nucleus of the atom. There's what's called the strong nuclear force. That's what holds the nucleus together because like charges repel, but protons are like charges. How do they not repel each other and shatter the nucleus? Strong nuclear force. Then there's something called the weak nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force also acts inside the nucleus. That's the one that explains radioactivity, why some particles sometimes decay. Both the strong and weak forces act over staggeringly short distances only, which is why they only affect things like the width of an atomic nucleus. They don't affect larger things. But those are the four, since you asked Although Newton predicted the need for the conversion factor, big G, its value was so small that he could not measure it. So he always set up his equations so that big G would cancel. Newton published around ooh, 1580, uh, it, sorry, 1680. It took a little hundred, over a hundred years for Henry Cavendish came up with a very, very clever experiment to measure that small. And it's cool enough, not on your test, but I got to show you what he did. Put your pencils down, please. And remember, he did this in 1798 with, you know, very old school technology. So he knew that any mass 
pulls on any other mass with a force of gravity. Right now, all of you are tugging on each other with a force of gravity. Ridiculously tiny, but it's there. So he said, maybe I can come up with a way to measure that tiny, tiny force and solve for G. Uh, I want a Cavendish experiment. I'm going to mute it because the music is kind of loud and irritating. So here's the setup. What we have is a styrofoam bar hanging from fishing line. You can't see the fishing line, but it's there. We have two steel balls on either end. Now the key is this styrofoam bar is free to rotate, is free to twist. Got me so far? What we're gonna do is we're gonna put a large mass right here and a large mass right here. Those masses will attract the steel bars due to gravity. So here's the top view. Bars free to rotate about the fishing line that you can't see because this is an older video. I need to see if there's a newer one, but I just haven't had a chance to. We've put two lead bricks with big masses. So this brick will attract that with a force of gravity. This brick will attract that with a force of gravity. This will twist. Time lapse, but it will twist. Cavendish set this up, and by calculating the force required to twist the rope, he was able to say, now I can say that force equals the force of gravity, and I can solve for the big G. Brilliant. Brilliant. This took months. He had to leave this isolated for a long time in an enclosed room. And just to let you know, if we reverse the bricks, we can twist it the other way. Again, time lapse, but you can see it is moving, it does twist. Those two masses are pulling on each other with the force of gravity. Also because forces come in pairs, the steel ball is pulling on the same strength with the, the brick as the brick is pulling on the steel ball. Okay. Also, uh, this brick is pulling on this steel ball, but since it's further away, those cancel out somewhat. Cavendish did this, and he got that 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. And one of the very first things he did was calculate the mass of the Earth. Up until then, the mass of the Earth... Yeah? Sorry? I don't think there is a vegetable named... There, it might be named after a different Cavendish, but I don't think it's named after this Cavendish. Nice segue. We're back because I'm about to give you something cool, so shut up. Uh, Cavendish had this number, and he realized he could calculate the mass of the Earth. Up until then, the mass of the Earth had been a guesstimate, and literally what they had done is they had measured the mass of average shovels of dirt and said, okay, how many shovels of dirt would fill up the volume of the Earth? That's how much the Earth must have as a mass. That was their best guess. Cavendish realized he could go like this. He said, I have Newton's equation for universal gravitational field strength. Write that down. I can get big M by itself, the mass of the Earth by itself. Donald, how would I get the mass of the Earth by itself? Stuff moves diagonally. Like the R squared to the top? Yep. And then you divide by it. Yeah, and we'll have to talk about big G and little g. That'll be how we'll keep them separate, okay? And so he said, okay, the mass of the Earth is going to be little g r squared divided by big G. Now, little g he knew was 9.8. We've known the radius of the Earth. In fact, Eratosthenes did a very good experiment to calculate the radius of the Earth about 2000 BCE. Sorry, about uh, 300 BCE. So we've known for about 2,000 years. From your formula sheet, from your data section, what's the radius of the Earth? It starts with a 6. I know that. Don't forget the squared. Divided by 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. We're going to be doing a lot of complicated scientific notation equations in this next unit, so all of you want to try typing this in to make sure that you can, please. I'll pause.
And I think I'm going from memory. This is on your data sheet so you can double check. Is the mass of the Earth 5.98 times 10 to the 24th? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, let me pause for a second. Don't. So Cavendish looked at this and he was gobsmacked because it was way too big. This here was the first hint that it isn't dirt all the way down. What do we think is at the center of our Earth? A very dense iron core, we now believe. This was the first hint that it's not dirt all the way down. He's, I also, I can imagine him sitting there briefly knowing he was the only person in history who had that little piece of information right then. I know what my planet weighs. I know what my world, what the mass of my world is. And right now, I'm the only one. That's got to be kind of cool. Better than a vegetable. <laughs> Turn the page. Okay. So let's talk about the universal force of gravity or what we call universal gravitation. You may have heard the law of gravity. This is what they're talking about when they refer to that. This is what Newton came up with. So we've said that gravity is a force that exists between the earth and masses on its surface. Gravity is universal. All objects with mass, all atoms, send out a gravitational field. And the more mass, the stronger that field. The diagram below shows two masses, big M and little m. Big M is the bigger mass. You know what? Let's make this Earth, and let's make this Moon. Compare the gravity forces on the two masses. So they definitely are attracting each other. Sorry, I drew those backwards. Earth will be pulling that way, Moon will be pulling that way. Which of the following is correct? A, the force exerted by the Earth is larger. B, the force exerted by the Moon is larger. Or C, they're the same. Let's vote. How high you hold your hand up is how sure you are of the answer. So the Earth and Moon do pull on each other. Which of the forces is bigger? Who says, obviously, Mr. Duick, Earth is bigger, so it's A. One, two, three, four, five. Who says, no, the moon makes the tides go. The moon has to be larger. Who pays attention and knows Newton's laws? What are you all going to say? Why? Forces come in? Darn right, baby. Now, because of that, the moon does feel the same force as the earth. The Earth feels the same force as the Moon. Do they have the same mass? So do they accelerate the same way? No. Same force, though. Okay. Since we have an expression for universal gravitational field, gravitational field anywhere in... Oh, you know what? Hang on, hang on. I, I wrote it here. Universal gravitational field is big G, big M over R squared. And how did we write weight? Little m, G. We can plug this into there and get a universal gravitational equation. We get little m, big G, big M over R squared. Although we usually write it in this order. The force of gravity anywhere in the universe is big G. And then you can either write it m1, m2 over R squared, and I think that's how I put it on your formula sheet. Or often, if we're talking about a planet and a satellite, we'll use big M for the planet and little m for the satellite because that's kind of cool. What does this mean? This says that all objects with mass exert the same equal force on each other, but depending on your mass, that'll determine how you accelerate. Okay? In the box on the next page... Sometimes instead of an R, they'll put a D for the distance between the two objects. Still in meters. We need to do a little bit of math here, I think. 
Example three says, calculate the gravitational force between two one kilogram masses separated by one meter. So I had Max and Ronan standing one meter apart. What if instead I had two identical one kilogram masses like this one? Well, let's calculate that. So it's going to be the force of gravity is big G M1. I thought I hit unfreeze. Did not not go? Okay. There we go. M1, M2 over r squared. What is big G? 6.67. It's inconvenient, but it's what the universe has given us. What's M1? 1. What's M2? 1. Divided by... What do you get? Caleb! Put your calculator down. <laughs> Caleb, what's 6.67 times 10 to the 11 times 1? Times 1 divided by 1 squared. What's the answer in your head, Caleb, my friend? Times 10 to the negative 11, and that's Newton's. Is that big? No. When I hold two one kilogram masses a meter apart, I don't feel a tug between them. It's there but it's so small that my nervous system can't detect it. That's why you really only need to notice gravity on the planetary sizes. What direction is the force of gravity? What direction is the force of gravity? Generally, we would say towards the center of the object, although see if you can figure out what's going on here. So what's going on here? Yeah, it's tilted room and she's wearing a lot of hairspray or something because her hair is not twitching at all. And she must be wedged in there, but she's managing to look very relaxed, which is adding to it. Probably tilted at about a 45 degree angle. <laughs> drinking, drinking. <laughs> Yes, that'd be lovely. Thank you. No, I'll get it. What's nice about that is you can really see MG parallel, even though it's not where you think it is, but you can totally, that, that's what's pulling this gentleman sideways all the time, right? 
well done little comedy sketch. All right, example four. Suppose the force of gravity between two equal masses, let's call them little m, separated by a distance d is f. So we would have this. The force of gravity is big G, little m, little m over, I guess they want me to use d instead of r, and don't forget the squared. This is what we're starting with. What will be the force of gravity if we double the distance? How will it compare to the original? First of all, bigger or smaller? How many times? Yes. What if we triple the distance? What if we quadruple the distance? So if you look at the original Apollo moon rocket, for example, we used a three-stage rocket. The first massive rocket was to just get into low Earth orbit. And then we could use a much, much smaller rocket to get out to the moon and lunar orbit because by then we were dealing with some of those. Didn't need anywhere near as big. Oh, and to come home, we used a single engine tiny rocket just to get out of the moon's gravitational field. Easy peasy compared to getting out of the Earth's gravitational field. What if we double one of the masses? First of all, if we make m bigger, will f become bigger or smaller? Bigger. Is there a squared on the m or anything like that? So I think this is going to be 2 times larger. What if we double both masses? What if we cut the distance in half? Four times stronger. Good. What if we double both masses and double the distance? Okay. So there's kind of the math of how the universal gravitation equation works. Now, gravity is usually minuscule unless one of the masses is huge. For example, a planet or a star or a moon, but even the moon nowhere near as big. But all of you right now are exerting forces on each other. We don't even count them because the odds are pretty good. They're roughly uh, canceling out because look at where you're sitting. You you're roughly surrounded by people of roughly the same mass, and they're roughly all tugging on you in opposite directions, roughly. It's not something we take into account. How much more am I going to get through here? Oh, I'm almost done. Good. I am going to finish. Uh, assume the mass of the Earth is 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Pretty sure that's what I gave you on your formula sheet. Its radius is 6.380 times 10 to the 6th. Pretty sure I gave that to you on your formula sheet. Then find the force the Earth exerts on a 50 kilogram person. Okay, so we want to find the gravitational force by going big G, big M, little m over R squared. Hannah, what was big G again? Six point something, 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 something. Times 10 to the negative 11, yes. Mass of the Earth, 5.98 times 10 to the 24th. Mass of the person divided by 6.38 times 10 to the 6th. Don't forget the squared. All of you want to practice typing that in. That's the level of typing you're going to have to get in your sleep comfortable with. Oh, wait a minute. I can do this in my head. Correct. Squared. Those will cancel. 490? I think it's 490. Because if you can't type these in, you're in for a miserable unit. And it's better we figure out our mistakes now. We're going to 489.9 like or something like that, yeah? Like it's really close to 490. And of course, I didn't do this in my head. I cheated. 
Is it 490? If you didn't get the 490, snag me in a second at the end of the lesson and I'll walk you through it. Uh, what I actually did was I went little mg, I went 50 times 9.8, because that still has to work. And I got the 490, but you get the same thing using the universal gravitation equation. Okay? If you didn't get 490, call me in just a couple of minutes. What's your homework? So we need to practice this a little bit. You can certainly try number one, number three, Number five is crazy nasty. Yeah. You know what? No, I'll skip number five. Six is good, though. Seven is good. Eight is good. Please notice in number six, they gave you distances in kilometers. Do we do physics with kilometers? Do the conversion, please. Please notice in number eight, they gave you a distance in kilometers. Please do a conversion. Um, da, 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 da. Nine is good. Ten is good. I think I'll pause there.